Last year, Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs won Best Fiction Podcast at the People's Choice Podcast Awards. This year, we hope to do it again, but we need your help. Visit podcastawards.com at the link in the description and vote for Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs under Best Fiction and Best Male Host during the nomination period. And in return, I'll tell you a really cool story. Starting now. Can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Many people like taking a walk in the woods, enjoying the shade of the trees, admiring their stately beauty, and the abundance of life that thrives beneath their boughs. Trees are the oldest and largest living things on the planet. They stood by as the history of man has unfolded around them, watching nations rise and fall. What has that tree in your backyard beheld? What atrocities has it witnessed? And what will it do when it's finally seen enough? The Taking Tree For all her young life, Grandpa had taught Daphne about the trees on their land, the different species, where they grew, which ones bore fruit and nuts, and what the various woods were useful for. When one fell in a storm, or had just reached the end of its time, if it was the right kind, he lovingly milled it into lumber, which he used to make the furniture he sold for a living. The rest they used as fuel for their stove and fireplace. At every opportunity, he passed on his reverence for the trees to Daphne, instilling in her his devotion to the majestic forest that surrounded them. It seemed from Daphne's point of view that they went on forever. They would often walk along faint, shaded trails through the trees for hours. In truth, though at one time he laid claim to thousands of acres, over the years he had been forced to sell off various parcels to pay his taxes and other expenses when he didn't have enough wood to make tables and chairs to sell in town. At present, he owned fewer than a hundred acres, including the hill that his home and workshop were built upon. At the crest of that hill stood an ancient oak, its gnarled trunk so big, it took Daphne twelve steps to walk completely around it. Its branches spread out so far that even on a sunny day, it felt like dusk was looming when you sat beneath it. Eating lunch under its boughs with Grandpa was one of Daphne's favorite things to do. Even when it rained, they would enjoy the sandwiches and lemonade Grandpa would pack for them the foliage shielding them just as well from a cool autumn shower as the hot summer sun. As the years passed, it was Daphne who took over the task of making the lunch, replacing the packaged cookies Grandpa would sometimes buy with one she baked herself and adding a little less sugar to the lemonade than he did. She took one of the wooden rocking chairs from their front porch and placed it under the tree, as it was getting harder for Grandpa to get up and down off the gingham blanket she spread on the mossy ground beneath the old oak. She would fix him a plate with a sandwich and a pair of cookies. These days, the sandwich was often left untouched, but he always finished off the cookies, drinking the lemonade to quiet the coughing fits he seemed beset by more frequently each day. Grandpa insisted he was fine, but Daphne knew better. The cough he blamed on allergies and dust was getting harsher and wetter, and when she washed his clothes, she saw specks of blood on the crooks of his shirt sleeves. Then one day, Grandpa found himself unable to get out of bed. Daphne wanted to bring a doctor to their home, but he convinced her to just sit with him instead. A doctor would make him go to the hospital, and those places were noisy and stunk of medicine. He wanted to stay in his own bed, where the afternoon breeze carried in the scent of the woods and the flowers currently in bloom, and he could see the stately oak atop the hill through his window. Daphne brought his usual lunch into the bedroom on a tray and set it on the table next to his bed. Grandpa didn't even look at it not even the oatmeal raisin cookies that were his favorite. She sat on the rocking chair facing Grandpa, 
His gaze was fixed on the tree, framed by the curtains of his bedroom window, dancing in the breeze. When was the last time I told you a story? he asked in a hoarse voice. Daphne smiled. It had been years since she had grown out of that bedtime ritual, preferring to do her own reading of the books she regularly checked out of the modest library in town. I don't know, she replied. It's been a long time. Grandpa nodded, the movement of his head barely perceptible. Did I ever tell you the story of the dryads? he asked. Daphne certainly knew what dryads and homodryads were, nymphs from Greek mythology that inhabited the woods and protected the trees. She had read about them in countless books and stories, but couldn't remember Grandpa ever telling her about them. I don't think so, she replied. Grandpa closed his eyes for a moment, then turned to face Daphne, forcing his mouth into a smile. You never needed to know, he said. Know what? How they can be summoned. People think they are just a myth, but they are real, and there are times when they are needed. And I fear that time may be near. What are you talking about, Grandpa? I thought I would have more time, more time to prepare you before I passed. Daphne fought back a tear. Don't talk like that. You're going to live forever, Grandpa, she said. He smiled again. I must pass on what I know. It cannot die with me, as I fear I am the last person on this earth to know how to summon the spirit of the tree. You should rest, Grandpa. Don't try to talk. Save your strength. She reached out and placed her hand on his. His skin felt cold and papery. He grabbed her wrist with a force that frightened Daphne. The scars earned from decades of woodworking that formed a lattice along his forearm seemed to whiten with the strain. His eyes were wide open, and a sense of urgency shone from their dark pupils. Listen to me. You must know how the dryad is called, he insisted. Daphne nodded. Okay, she replied. The iron grip on her wrist relaxed, and his hand slackened and fell back onto the bed. He looked over at the glass of lemonade on the night table, and Daphne leaned over and guided its straw to his lips. He sipped slowly and carefully for a moment, then turned away and Daphne returned the glass to the table. Grandpa took a deep breath. It seemed like he was going to start another coughing fit. But instead, he turned his gaze back out toward the old oak. You must take an acorn from the tree before it has a chance to fall to the ground. He recited, as if he was passing on something that was told to him generations past. Then dig a hole under the branches of the tree, but where it can see the light of the full moon when it rises. Daphne could make sense of what he was saying, but she listened intently anyway. Do not wet it with water. You must use blood. He turned to face Daphne, a desperate look deepening his wrinkles. You must use blood, he repeated. Enough to soak the ground. He swallowed dryly. Daphne reached for the glass of lemonade, but he waved her off. She sat back, contemplating whether she should fetch a doctor despite Grandpa's wishes. He continued speaking as if talking in his sleep. From an acorn sown in this manner will come the spirit of the tree, the dryad, and she will protect it and all the trees of the forest. His voice trailed off. Daphne had a sudden fear that he was dead, but then she saw his chest rise slightly, then fall again. And when she placed her fingers on his fragile wrist, she could discern a pulse. She sat there, just watching him sleep, rocking back and forth in the chair, hewn from the wood of a tree from his own forest. It rained that night, a storm that lasted from the last light of dusk until the sun finally broke through the clouds again at dawn. Daphne went into the kitchen to put on a kettle for tea. It wasn't until she had lit a fire in the old wood stove and sat down at the kitchen table that she noticed the back door was open. The threshold was still damp. It must have been open all night. Had someone broken in? Or had someone gone out? Daphne rushed to Grandpa's bedroom. The bed was empty. She ran back to the kitchen and out the back door. In the rain-soaked ground was a muddy trail, as if something had been dragged through it, bending the sparse blades of grass, leaving a rut that led up to the hill toward the old oak tree. Daphne followed the trail. Grandpa, she shouted, are you out here? The tracks grew fainter as the grass got thicker, but the direction they were headed was unmistakable. At the base of the oak's trunk was a damp, dirty lump. She picked it up and discovered it was Grandpa's pajamas, soaked in mud. 
But where was he? Daphne stood at the base of the tree, glancing around the clearing that surrounded the hill for Grandpa or any signs of where he had gone. But there was nothing. How far could a sick, naked old man get? She wondered. Grandpa! She called into the stillness of the morning. Grandpa, where are you? An acorn fell from a high branch and hit her on the head. She looked up, expecting to see him nestled up in the branches, grinning at her, ready to jump down and laugh at the grand joke he had played. But all she saw was the twisted, ancient branches older than the United States, Grandpa had told her, with their shiny, pointed leaves and acorns dangling. Then she saw something else, something she'd never noticed before. A large burl, at least six feet across, set into the trunk about ten feet off the ground. It must have been there for decades to have grown so large, but for some reason this was the first time she had seen it. Maybe she had never looked up at that spot before, or maybe there had been branches covering it that had fallen away. Then she looked down at the pile of dirty pajamas and underwear, wondering just where Grandpa had gone. It was about a month after Grandpa disappeared when the man showed up. Daphne saw him out the kitchen window. He emerged from the woods, pausing to inspect the trees. When he entered the clearing and saw the grand oak perched atop the hill, he cinched the straps of his backpack and strode directly toward it. Daphne went to the hall closet and took out the shotgun Grandpa kept tucked behind the winter coats and boots. She settled the weapon into the crook of her arm, then headed for the back door and set herself on a course for the tree. Her distance was shorter, and the man didn't seem to notice her approach as his eyes were fixed on a towering trestle of foliage. Once he was close, she racked the shotgun. Its distinctive sound caught his attention. Daphne wasn't aiming it at him, but he raised his hands regardless, attempting to show he meant no harm. Hold on there, he said in a surprisingly disarming voice. No need to shoot. I surrender. You're trespassing, Daphne told him. Turn around and go back where you came from. The man locked eyes with Daphne assessing whether her intent matched the tone in her voice. He nodded, then moved one hand slowly toward a pocket in his vest. Now that's not quite true, he said with a grin that charmed Daphne much more than she wanted to admit. It ain't trespassing if it's my land. It's not your land. She swung the barrel of the shotgun in his direction. I'm not going to tell you again. Leave. A pained expression erased his grin as he pulled a folded sheet of paper out of the pocket. He held it out to her. This deed says otherwise. Daphne reached out for the paper, then took a step back as she unfolded and inspected it. You see, the man continued, the previous owner was in arrears on his taxes. The county put this land up for auction, and now it belongs to me. That's wrong. It belongs to Grandpa, she said. Okay, the man said in a calm, reasonable voice. Then maybe we should go talk to him. He's gone. Daphne responded. When will we be back? Daphne didn't answer. The man drew the obvious conclusion. My apologies and condolences. You're his granddaughter, then. I'm guessing you thought this land passed on to you, but the fact is he was more than a year behind on his taxes. Surely he must have gotten a letter or a phone call. He looked toward the small house in the nearby barn that had served as Grandpa's workshop. There were no power or telephone lines leading toward it and no driveway wound its way through the surrounding forest toward the nearest road. You live here all by yourself? No electricity? What do you do for food? I have food. If I need to, I go into town. It's quite a walk, the man replied. I don't mind it. He nodded in understanding. Well, listen, I'm sorry about your grandfather, and I'm sorry that he didn't keep up with the taxes and put you in this position. But these woods, he said, waving his arm around in a sweeping gesture, that house, he added, with a look in the direction of Daphne's home. And this tree, he said with a tone of awe in his voice, all belong to me now. Daphne knew about such things as taxes and forfeitures and auctions. She had read about them among the thousands of books she had checked out from the library over the years. But for her, the world was this land, the house, and the town three miles away. She'd never had need of anything else. Grandpa always took care of her. But Grandpa was gone. She lowered the gun, and a tear ran down her cheek. Listen, why don't we go to your house and talk this over? Maybe we can come to some sort of accommodation, the man suggested. She nodded, then started trudging back toward the house. Daphne poured some lemonade, prepared a plate of cookies, then joined the man at the kitchen table. 
He was admiring its carefully crafted surface and the chair he was sitting on. Did your grandfather make these? he asked. Yes, he had a workshop out in the barn. The man whistled his admiration. Whew. And with no power tools, that is old school. He took a sip of the lemonade, seemingly equally impressed with its flavor as he was the quality of the table it rested upon. I'm a furniture maker myself. I picked up this land because it's one of the last tracks of old growth left around here. I'm lucky someone at one of the lumber mills didn't snatch it up. Daphne didn't say anything. I saw a burl on that oak on top of the hill. Do you have any idea what a knot of wood that size is worth? He asked. She didn't answer. Thousands. If you were to make it into a dining room table, maybe a desk? Heck, a burl that size, I could do both with matching chairs. You want to cut down my tree? Daphne asked, horrified. The man laughed. Well, isn't that what they're for? He asked, patting the table they were sitting at. Grandpa never cut them down. He only took the ones that fell or were struck by lightning. He nodded. Probably why he couldn't pay his taxes. Daphne folded her hands in her lap and looked down. Look, I'm not a bad guy. There's no reason why you can't stay here. I won't even charge you rent. She looked up, hopeful. And you'll leave the trees alone? Well, then I'd be in the same spot as your grandfather. And the next guy to pick this place up would probably clear-cut the lot. There's a lot of valuable timber out there. No need to cut down the whole forest. And Grandpa's oak? She asked hopefully. He shrugged apologetically. You see now, that's the one that's going to allow me to be so generous. The man rose from the table, hefted his pack onto his back, and looked at Daphne. That's the deal. You can stay here as long as you like, but the trees belong to me now, he said. Take it or leave it. Daphne was silent. You think it over, he said, then grabbed a cookie and headed out of the house. Daphne searched through the old roll-top desk where Grandpa kept track of his furniture business. In one drawer, she found a stack of letters from the county, overdue notices and warnings. She tore them up in frustration, pounded the solid wood surface of the desk until her hands ached, and then leaned forward and rested her head on it and cried. What could she do? She was all alone. Then she remembered Grandpa's last conversation with her, the night before he disappeared. She recalled the ritual he had described to bring forth the dryad, the protector of the trees. It was crazy, but maybe there was something to it. Something had happened to Grandpa under that old oak. Could it have been a dryad that had taken him to his reward, to become a part of the trees he had loved so much? Had that burl been there all along, or was it? She struggled to remember what he had said. She knew it required a full moon, and fortunately one would be rising that very night. Also an unfallen acorn. The tree was ripe with them at present. And blood. She would have to soak the acorn in her own blood without somehow killing herself in the process. She found the large bowie knife in its sheath Grandpa always had attached to his belt, grabbed the washcloth and an old pillowcase from the linen closet, and climbed back to the top of the hill. The man was gone, and the sun was just starting to set. The moon would be rising over the eastern horizon, so she used the knife to carve a small ditch out of the densely packed soil under the tree, careful to remain under the protection of its boughs, but in a spot where the moonlight would find it. Then she searched the branches for the perfect acorn, one that wasn't still green but instead plump with promise. She carefully plucked one from its branch and nestled it into the rent earth. Kneeling, Daphne positioned her arm over the hole, then ran the razor-sharp blade of the bowie across her flesh. The cut welled with blood, but little more than drips fell upon the acorn. Daphne pressed the point of the knife into a spot halfway between her wrist and elbow and pushed it into her flesh. She ignored the pain and sliced toward her elbow just an inch or so, then withdrew the blade. Blood quickly pooled on her arm. She positioned the wound directly over the acorn, and let the blood spill into the ground. There was so much. Within seconds, the acorn was submerged in the thick red liquid. She grabbed the washcloth and pressed it against the wound. It was instantly soaked, transforming the white terry cloth fabric into crimson. She grabbed the strips of the pillowcase she had cut earlier and wound them tightly around her arm to the point of being painful. The bleeding seemed to have slowed, if not stopped completely. She tied the remaining strips around her arm, then covered the acorn in its ensanguined furrow with dirt. She felt light-headed and laid back, staring up at the gnarled bark covering the burl on the great oak's trunk as darkness enveloped her.
The sound of a loud diesel engine woke her. It was morning. She looked around but couldn't see its source. Then, a great yellow machine crashed through the woods, heading straight for the hill. Daphne pushed herself up to a sitting position, causing a wave of pain in her left forearm. She gazed at the makeshift bandage, then looked at the spot where she had planted the acorn and watered it with her own blood. It was just a patch of ground. What did she expect? A magic seedling? That a wood nymph would grow from it? Grandpa was just a crazy old man after all. The sound of the excavator climbing the hill grew closer and stopped altogether. Daphne got to her feet and looked over at it. Its folded arm with a tooth bucket at the end of it was nearly ten feet tall. The man, who was now the land's owner, cut the engine and stepped down out of the cab, then unstrapped an enormous chainsaw from the back of the machine. Its blade was nearly as long as Daphne was tall. Step away, little girl, the man said condescendingly. The friendly overtures were gone. He was single-minded in his purpose. I checked in town. The old man who owned this place didn't have any children, let alone a granddaughter. I don't know what kind of sick relationship you two had, and I don't care. But you don't want to get in my way. With a practiced motion, he grabbed the pull handle and let the momentum of the saw falling away from him combined with an upward yank bring the mighty machine to life with a gasoline-powered roar. Daphne shook her head, helpless. She rushed toward the tree and set herself between it and the man. You think I won't do it? This is my land. That is my tree. And you are the one trespassing. I have every right to cut right through you, he swore. Daphne felt a well of emotion rising up in her, starting at her feet, then up through her gut, all the way to her head. A level of anger she had never experienced before. It felt like power as if her feet were rooted to the ground, and she was as immovable as the oak behind her. Strength coursed through her veins, and determination hooded her eyes in a way that gave the man pause. An acorn hit him on top of the head, surprising him. Then another dropped, landing on his shoulder. He looked up, and a half a dozen more showered down on him, causing him to almost lose his balance. He raised the long blade of the chainsaw and cut through the nearest bough, as if it was a hot knife slicing through butter. The branch crashed to the ground. Daphne felt a pain in her arm, as if it had been cut from her body. But when she looked at it, it was still there. She curled her hand into a fist, and a torrent of acorns released from the branches above the man, pelting him with a hundred hard nuts. He backed away and tripped over the branch, losing his footing and his grip on the chainsaw. He landed on the hard ground heavily, his face inches from the sharp teeth of the saw. He scrambled to his feet, picking up his tool, and opened the throttle until its roar was deafening. Daphne held her ground, both her fists now tight balls, her feet anchored tightly in place, waiting for him to strike. The man advanced with the chainsaw, its whirring chain so close to Daphne she could feel it throwing off small drops of oil toward her cheek. If he wanted this tree, he was going to have to go through her. Then suddenly, he snapped back, as if something had yanked him. He dropped the chainsaw, and this time, its blade ground to a halt in the dirt, causing the motor to sputter and die. One of the branches of the old oak was somehow wrapped around the man's waist. It lifted him off the ground. More branches got a hold of his arms and legs as he struggled wildly against them. Then Daphne realized it wasn't the tree that was retaliating against its attacker. It was her. She was orchestrating the movement of the oak's limbs passing him from branch to branch until he was pressed against the trunk of the tree, right above where she was standing. Who are you? the man asked, as the bark of the old oak started to engulf him. I am the dryad of this tree and this forest, she answered, and she instantly knew it was true. The reason her ritual hadn't called forth the wood nymph was because the dryad was her. Grandpa hadn't told her what she needed to do, he was recounting what he had done. It was Grandpa who had summoned her from the tree, then raised her as his granddaughter so that she might protect the forest when this day came. The man howled as bark grew over his neck and ears and eyes until he was silenced when wood filled his mouth. Daphne felt the power drain out of her, flowing down from her head and hands through her body and out the soles of her feet, back into the roots of the tree. She looked up, there were now two burls bulging from the trunk of the old oak. She turned to the first one and said, 
Thank you, Grandpa. Then she gazed out at the forest, and the trees seemed to bow toward her as a strong wind blew through their branches. Thank you for listening to The Taking Tree, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Don't forget to vote at the Podcast Awards. You can select Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs for both Best Fiction Podcast and Best Male Podcast Host. Visit podcastawards.com using the link in the description. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast app or Audible and share these stories with anyone you know who likes audiobooks. You can find out more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosick.com. Thanks again, and all the very best. Seriously, if you can pop on over to podcastawards.com and help me out, that'd be great. Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs, Best Fiction, and Best Male Host. I owe you one.